all of this, we're joined now by longtime airline analyst Robert Kakanis. He's founder and managing director at AirTrav. Robert, let's start with the news on Lynx itself. What was your reaction? Uh, I think like like Duncan D, somewhat surprised it was Lynx. Um, they, they had a seasoned management team. They lost their CEO last summer. Um, but you're, I think Duncan is right. The, the main U.S. partner that was backing Lynx, uh, you know, very, very seasoned, starting up and running low-cost carriers around the world. But I think what it does show, whether it was Lynx or somebody else, that, uh, you know, starting up a discount carrier in this country is, uh, is not for the faint of heart and comes with a lot of risk. Does that mean there could be more challenges for other discount operators? I mean, we have a lot of structural issues in this country, a lot of reasons why it's difficult to, uh, to, to make a go of it. Um, you know, will, will Lynx's failure be good for, for Flair? Possibly it will. I mean, Flair will look at the roots that, uh, and again, only that 2% share of seats in the domestic marketplace, but Flair will probably look to pick up some of that space. But I think it also just begs the question, how is this country structured for support of the aviation business? And why do we lose carriers like Lynx? Do we need to change the way the country is structured, how we travel even? What would be an example of things to consider on that front? So structural costs, uh, taxes, fees, and charges can is one of the most expensive aviation jurisdictions in the world. Um, there was a comment in a Global Mail article yesterday from the Canadian Airports Council that, well, look, in the U.S., um, uh, infrastructure costs of airports are, are really subsidized across the entire taxpayer spectrum. In Canada, we have more of a user pay uh, model. That may be the, the, the true, and it may be true as well that airport costs are only one piece of it, but when I take into consideration all the tax and fees, even an excise tax on jet fuel in this country, it makes it very difficult for these low cost carriers to stimulate the market. Look at Lynx or Flair, whoever, it's not about stealing the passenger from Air Canada or WestJet. It's about stimulating and growing the whole pie. But when your starting point for that fare, for that $39 fare, becomes $99 or over $100, that's a problem. And while a $39 fare is problematic in this country because of those reasons, $39 fares exist in places like Europe and the U.S. and elsewhere. We've got a big country, vast distances, very little population uh, uh, pockets. Um, we've got a high degree of seasonality. We've got that very strong summer season, a very sharp sun season in March, but the shoulder seasons either side, it's a challenge. Um, lack of secondary airports in Europe, you know, remnants from the Second World War, lots of secondary airports, which are generally cheaper to use for the carriers. And, and the last one, I guess, reason is, is the mainline carriers themselves have been adapting to the presence of these discount carriers and putting both uh, yield and cost pressure down the downstream on those discount carriers. So it, it's tough in this country. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, Flair is still there. We have jet lines, which is not a scheduled low cost carrier. They're sort of focusing on more opportunistic charter flying. Um, and, and maybe they'll decide to jump into the scheduled freight given Lynx's demise. But again, it's a challenge. But I, at the end of the day, John, we as a country, we cannot afford to lose uh, the discount uh, airline support because we don't want to go back to the days where only the well-heeled travelers could travel. We're a vast country. We're, we're able to move more people with our discount carriers because they've got a price point that does appeal to them and to their families. And, and all on all those tax and fees, I might add, it's not just a single traveler, but a, a family of four, uh, you know, from a price elasticity standpoint, if, we, if, the, if the costs are layered on so much, all these taxes, fees, and charges, it does make it very difficult for uh, some of these folks to travel. So that, in a nutshell, is sort of where we are in this country. And at the end of the day, we have one less low-cost player. So what does that mean for airline prices going forward? I think a lot of people are trying to figure that out. Yeah, well, it's funny. I, if I go back to actually just recently to Air Canada's fourth quarter filing uh, yield, which really in the airline speak is the quality of revenue because we, we measure passenger revenue on a per mile basis, started to flatten out in the fourth quarter versus the first nine months of the year. And does that mean that maybe consumers are, are hitting a bit of a wall? So perhaps if demand's down or starting to ebb a little bit, that would be good news from a pricing standpoint. Look, Flair is still there. Flair is going to get a bit more aggressive maybe on the 
those former Lynx routes. Uh, WestJet, which as you know, integrated uh, low, their low cost uh, unit um, uh, swoop last fall. They promised to roll out ultra low cost carrier fares on their, their fleet and on the routes uh, worldwide. And, and, and also Porter, you mentioned Mike Deleuze. I mean, Mike and his Porter team may not be an ultra low cost carrier, but you know they're, a, they're an economy class focused product and they're adding the equivalent of one Embraer 132 seat jet basically per month. So airline economics 101, the more seat capacity you put in there uh, helps to keep pricing at a, at a reasonable level. So I don't expect any major changes to pricing this summer, I think the worry is downrange. Maybe uh, you know within the next year or so, if we lost another player or something else substantively changed in the marketplace, that would be my concern. But we have to get behind uh, the Canadian aviation sector. Uh, we treat it like a cash cow, and I think that this is the whole user pay system, as we saw during the pandemic, when folks stopped traveling through airports, mm -hmm. it was a real problem. And I think we had to take a fundamental look. This is going up to a government of Canada level as to how we run this business because we're our own worst enemies. Canadians, if you look through the user comments on, on media stories or on X, formerly Twitter, people complain that there's not enough competition in Canada, but then they go and complain about their trip on name the airline. And, uh, and maybe that's more of a Canadian thing, but we have to get behind it because at the end of the day, a 5,500 kilometer wide country east to west, plus whatever north to south, another 3,000 kilometers, we rely upon air transport to move people and services and goods and and we need all levels of carriers we need flag or network full serve carriers we need the intermediate carriers like a porter and we need the low cost crowd as well right. to give everybody a fair chance to to travel from coast to coast to coast robert thank